Okay, hello everybody. Welcome tonight and thanks for joining us. My name is Risa Levine and I'm a member of the class of 1983 and a vice president of the alumni board. And I'm very much enjoying being part of the Brandeis Women's Network. The Brandeis Women's mission is simple, to foster and build connections between Brandeis women. Since our formation in June of 2019, our network has grown tremendously. Our Facebook group is almost 1400 Brandeis alumna and mothers of Brandesians, which you can find by searching Brandeis women, one word. We also have a LinkedIn page you can find by searching Brandeis University's Women's Network. We've been thrilled with the stunning array of programming that we have offered to the Brandeis community, such as tonight's very special event with Hadassah Lieberman. Please be sure to continue to check your email and social media for more invitations to our upcoming events. Before we begin tonight's program, a couple of guidelines to enhance our enjoyment of the evening. First, of course, this is a Brandeis event and we will have time for questions after our discussion. If you have questions, we ask that you specifically use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. The chat will be open, but you can use that to um, announce where you're from right now uh, and let us know where you're, where, where you're Zooming in from. And also to say hello to each other. If you see people that you would like to privately chat with, you can do that directly too. We expect a lot of questions tonight, so please be patient and um, we will try to get to as many as we can. I also recommend that you use your speaker view for this discussion for this evening. Also, please note that this event is being recorded and the recording will be available after the event in the virtual library found on the Alumni Association's website. And now to the program. I'm turning the program over to Lisa Crank, Lisa grew up in Connecticut, but currently lives in Nashville, Tennessee and Kennebunkport, Maine. She graduated from Brandeis in 1975, received her MBA from Columbia University in 1977, and spent a career of more than 36 years in corporate marketing. She was chief marketing officer at AutoZone, a Fortune 500 company for 11 years, and was named one of the top marketing leaders in the United States by Execurank. Post-retirement, she has served on several corporate boards and is currently involved in several nonprofit organizations, including serving as a member of Brandeis' Board of Trustees. Like Hadassah Lieberman, Lisa is also the daughter of Holocaust survivors. Lisa, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Risa, and thank you for inviting me, and thank you for inviting Hadassah. Um, and without further ado, uh, I'm delighted to welcome Hadassah to our family at Brandeis. Uh, Hadassah, for those of you who don't know, was born in Prague to Holocaust survivors, is the wife of former U.S. Senator Joe Lieberman of Connecticut, the Democratic nominee for vice president on the ticket with Al Gore in 2000. She has built a career devoted largely to public health that has included positions at Lehman Brothers, Pfizer, and the National Research Council. She holds a BA in government and dramatics from Boston University and a master's degree in international relations and American government from Northeastern University. So welcome Hadassah um, and we're glad you're now part of the Brandeis family. Um, so welcome. Uh, I just, from a personal standpoint, would like to say that I found your book to be really very real, very relatable and very down to earth. So I think this will be a delightful and wonderful event for, for all of us to share together. So thank you for graciously being here today with thank us. Thank you. So without further ado, I, I'm gonna start uh, questions and um, they're based on uh, my reading of the book, which again, uh, I read in one sitting because it just, kept, it was a page turner. So thank you for that. You mentioned uh, in the book, uh, why you decided to write the book. Um, but if you could tell us, and for those of us who might not have read at the, by now the book, tell us why you decided to write the book and why you decided to write it at this time. Well, I came as an immigrant to this country and it was really after the experiences my parents had had 
in out my mother Auschwitz and liberated from Dachau, my father's slave labor camp. And so after those colossal tales, some of which I heard earlier, many of which I read about in reading other people's books. One day when my mother was dying and I was cleaning out, clearing things, saving things to bring them to New Haven, Connecticut, I found a diary by my mother and it was in Czech, the language, which I never knew because my parents tried to keep certain languages private. Yiddish was always one that we talked in the house. So I knew Yiddish and I didn't know English when I was a baby, but this happened. And then when the Holocaust Museum gave it to a person who understands Czechoslovakian language and I read it, I was so shocked because my mother said, I can't write any more than I've written. And I am asking my children, me and my brother, would they please finish the story, write more? Well, when I read that, I was again overwhelmed and looked at the date, it was 1970, and wondered why had she waited until 1970. But so it happened that I just knew I had to write. And it was, it was tough because I'd lived this through my life. And as you know, as a child of survivors, sometimes the parents don't talk about it. Other times it comes up. And still other times, as those of us who have read so many diaries and stories know, there's a lot they don't talk about. There's a lot you never know. And then when you read what others are saying, you say, wait a minute, what happened to my mother and father? And so that was how I started it. And that's why it happened now for no other reason. So that sounds like a great reason to me, for sure. Um, what did you learn about yourself in writing this book? Um, you've been very gracious in the book in terms of giving advice based on your life experience, which has been vast and varied. But what did you learn about yourself when you wrote the book? I learned, I knew, but I learned more intensely that I had so much inside of me shaped from my parents' experiences. And I went back and you know, wrote about the immigration aspects and early education and being an immigrant who doesn't know the language and has to help your parents make a doctor's appointment, do something they don't understand the reading of just everything made you different. And so when I went to kindergarten in Gardner, Massachusetts, small New England town, where no one spoke Yiddish, I was in kindergarten and had an interesting day, which was amongst those when there was a basket above my head with little toys and candies. And I thought, I've been a good girl and they're doing this. I never heard of that. And I went home and my mother said, in Yiddish, she said, how was your day? And I looked at her, I said, mommy, no more Yiddish, only English. So there I was in the process of learning a new language. So, so many of the stories that I knew had to do with the differences I had shared with others in kindergarten and in various walks of life that no one else understands, including my mother saying, oh, nish does the food. No, very you know, she made her own recipes. Yep. And so anyone coming into my house didn't know what that was. It was cute. Right, right. Um, I remember someone coming to our house and they would say, your mother has an accent. And I would say, she does? Yeah. yeah. 
I didn't notice it. I mean, it's, it was. Oh, like, it's the it, same thing. Same thing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You were very open um, about yourself in the book and uh, the good, the bad, the not so good. Um, but what didn't you write in the book that maybe now you wish you had? Well, I truthfully, there were a few things in the book that I would have written down, but then I thought I have to be honest, like, you know, working for breast cancer for the Susan Conant people. And I worked for them and did international assemblages, including two races in Israel that had every nationality, every kind of language walking behind me in Jerusalem. And there were things that I never thought that I might get a stage one, but nevertheless, stage one of breast cancer. And I was shocked. I wasn't going to, I didn't talk about it then. And I wasn't going to tell anyone, but then I thought that's wrong because you have to support women in different ways. Plus being divorced, I had to talk about the impact that has on your children, on yourselves, on your remarriage. And I just wanted to share that we never used the word step for any of our children. We never differentiated between them. They were our children and neither Joe nor I would have wanted to marry a person who totally didn't understand that and couldn't love each other's children. And that was a big lesson to some people. They were surprised, but I was surprised that people make things work if they do anything less than that. Right. So those are amongst the many stories yep. that you write about for lessons. Yep. Um, what would your parents say about this book, particularly your mother, since you mentioned her diary and her, her writings? I think she would be very proud. I called her Momich in one of the chapters. I, that was the name I made up for my mommy, sort of a Yiddish, is Momich. And she would have been proud. They both would have been very proud and probably amazed that I did this but amazed that I was sharing it. And you know, what really brought me to doing this book was that I was so lucky. Yes, I was born in Prague. Yes, I was the immigrant. Yes, I had parents from these places different from everyone around me, but I married Joe for 36 years and all of a sudden, he was trying to help me, kept saying, you know, words to me all the time, go with it, you're doing the right thing, you're doing it. And because I was the wife of a senator who had run for the vice presidency, I felt, okay, I'm gonna take advantage of this moment to write something for people who may know nothing about this chapter in history. And unfortunately, there are a lot of young people who know very little and others who don't want to know more. And I didn't want to make the mistake of letting it go and not taking advantage of that. That's great. Uh, you are an immigrant, proudly who obviously uh, you've made it on many levels in terms of American success. Um, what advice would you give to immigrants today, especially given how tense the topic tends to be uh, in this day and age, unfortunately? Absolutely, a problem. Well, let me first start with a little story. When my husband was getting his driver taking him to the law firm. And I was in the back seat with Joe talking about the book that I was trying to write. And I started talking about immigration and some of the sagas of interest 
that I wanted to write about. And the man in the front seat, who Pakistani birth, looked, he turned around for a minute and said, when this book comes out, I want my son and daughter to read the chapter on immigration because that speaks to me and that's what I want to talk about with them. I was so touched by that, totally touched by it because it was someone from a completely different background and yet so interested. And I found, you know, I have something here about the immigration experience that I'll quickly share from the book. And I wanna get the right one because I have so many things here. Oh, wait, no, not that one. I'll get it. Take your time. Okay, yes. If I had to summarize the essence of the American immigrants experience in a single word, I would choose promise. I've met thousands of my fellow immigrants and promise runs through us like current through copper wire. The word itself promise means both a vow that something will happen and the potential for achievement. I'm not suggesting that American immigrants view the United States as a utopia where all of their problems magically disappear. Immigrating to a new country has never been easy. It can be an arduous, sometimes terrifying and often disorienting experience. Immigrants find themselves uprooted from all that is familiar in a place where the food seems strange, the language indecipherable, the culture endlessly confusing, the dislocation that comes from living far from extended family and facing the difficulty of finding work can be daunting. Even minor differences can make them stand out in a way that has them questioning where they belong, it is a willing sacrifice, yes, but a sacrifice nonetheless. And excuse my horsening from the hay fever, I think. Well, I think that's, I think that's um, poignant, and I think that explains um, a lot about your thinking about immigrants. Anything else you want to tell us about? You, you're a... a, a um, you have a special perch when it comes to immigration because of the role you play as a polit politician's wife, as well as being an immigrant. Anything else that you would want? Yes, well, yes, let me share something I was thinking of as you asking the question that I just remember the campaign events. And when we were in actually in Tennessee announcing Joe and you know the acceptance and the come upcoming election. I will never forget how people lined up in front of us. And I can't tell you how many immigrants from different places totally with different colored skin, different languages came up to me and said things like, I like you. You understand immigrants. And they just kept doing that. We went to airports and I was there coming up to me with all kinds of braids and dreadlocks and whatever suited them from their background, telling me, we appreciate your understanding. And I was so touched because that's really what we found happening as we bonded around the country with the differences that are part of us, whether that's immigration, religiously totally different. Had so many people were in the Midwest and I remember I would have to take a plane to different places because Tipper would be going places out. And I will never forget getting somewhere and 
these people came up to me. I had no idea if they were Democrat or Republican. These were just people out there. I had no idea about anything. They came up to me and said, thank you. I like your husband. He's honest and he's religious. And we like that. And we had so many people bonding with us Mm -hmm. That I was always surprised when some people said, oh, did you have any negative experiences because of the who or what? And I would say, no. Uh Now, that was in 2000. I don't know what goes on from there. But that was 100% true in 2000. I think that's a great case study about why immigration is a wonderful thing in this country. Um, At one point in the book, you say that being a political spouse is not so different than being a rabbi's daughter. Um, I found that to be uh, an interesting analogy. I really wanted you to help us understand why you said that. I said it because when you're a rabbi, when I was a rabbi's daughter and we moved to a town near New Hampshire and very small Jewish community, and my father had been ordained, he'd studied law, he was ordained as a rabbi, but you know, you come to this country, you have to do law all over. And he decided that he wanted to take a position as a rabbi. And we ended up in Gardner, Massachusetts, near the New Hampshire border. And I just remember how it was to be, you're single, that you're the rabbi's daughter. So anyone would say, oh, well, why did the rabbi's daughter do that? Or why did you, you know, there's that kind of judgmental stuff that goes on. Now, maybe less so. I understand I'm talking about, you know, X number of years ago where everything was different, where in politics, You didn't say what came to your mind all the time. Mm -hmm. You shut your mouth and spoke when it was appropriate. And so that was always the way I felt because I always had to be careful. And my parents were very strict that way. My father, you know, there were things he didn't like me to do. My mother, there were certain times I, I remember in kindergarten, I remember this. I wanted to wear my hair. I saw these girls wearing it loose. And my mother said, no, braids or a ponytail. Well, I was not like, at that point, they weren't wearing braids and ponytail. Or my parents said, no slacks. A girl wears a skirt. But you know that that was a different age. Now we wear whatever we yeah, want to wear. Right. And, you know, and people in politics. Uh-huh are not necessarily abiding by that. Old, I remember Joey said to me um, one time, I said something, I don't remember what it was. And Joe said, if you say that loudly in public, it will be on the front page of the Hartford Current. <laughs> well, I, I didn't realize, you know, but I found out quickly. <laughs> yep. <laughs> one time was probably enough at that point oh right? yes for me it was enough I've been raised by a rabbi so that's what I mean <laughs> <laughs> okay so you are a proud survivor um, and the survivor the fact that you are a survivor has shaped your philosophy around life which you write about in the book and I find it so positive and energizing what you're about is the possibilities of the future are more endless and positive than the difficulties of the past. Um, Have you ever doubted that philosophy and what keeps bringing you back to it? Never, I never doubted it. I went through times in my life where I could have been down about X, Y, Z. So I'm not saying everything was perfect and everything was beautiful, but I really, I felt I had come out of a darkness being born to my parents right after the war. And I was lucky that they survived and I survived. And I remember my mother was talking about being in labor after the war. And there was a Christian woman screaming, 
yes, she's Maria. And my mother, I got, I, you know, and they were in the same place and they were going through childbirth. And so it was just something that was part of my, my lifestyle since I've been a child. But my dream was to come out of that darkness, writing about this much later, and come in to light that started coming in and in and in. And then when I met Joey, thank God, or as in Hebrew, it's Baruch Hashem, I was really, I was so happy. And then I started to march and march near him. And, you know, the jobs I had, but it was ultimately really something tied up with politics. Mm -hmm. And then moving on to times of when he was running for attorney general, we were dating and then he was senator, US senator, which was another adventure. And then to be part of a national campaign for vice president, I was standing up there at these rallies on the stage and I was there as an individual, as Hadassah Freilich Lieberman, I know that, but I was representing people who came up, I can't tell you how many people came up rolling their sleeves up to show me their numbers and I used to have to tell the Secret Service, the, the police, they're all taking them away. And I said, please, they've never seen me, people like me standing, representing the United States, mm -hmm. campaigning for an election. So one of the guys on you know, the staff that was guarding Joe and the campaign said to me, because they went for breaks, they had a few weeks in between, because it was a tough job. And he came back and he said, they're still crying in the audience. So I had to explain to him, I said, you have to understand what they went through. They have the tears that come out when they see me. I'm the daughter of survivors like them. Mm -hmm. And he just couldn't believe they're still crying, but people don't get it. And so it was an important, I wanted that book. Like I sat on the Senate floor, the time that Joe was being oriented, he had won for the Senate, they hadn't sworn him in, but we were sitting there orientation. And I sat next to him in a desk there, and I looked, Joe, and I said, what are you thinking now, Joey? And he said, I'm looking at these American political people posted all across the Senate. And I'm so proud to be here today to serve this country in this body. And he looked at me and he said, what are you thinking? I'm thinking I have my fist in the air to Hitler. I am here with my parents in the upper balcony watching with others and my children who are up there. And it was an amazing moment. And that's, you know, one of the lights that come out. Yes, yes. A wonderful, wonderful, wonderful life experience for sure. Um, best advice you ever received about, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Okay. Speaking yeah. of being a politician's wife, what is the best advice you ever received about being a politician's wife? Because that's a tricky situation. Um, and you, you uh, handled it with grace, it seems like, as, a, uh, as an observer. So... Tell us how you managed um, to do that. And how I managed to do it is not necessarily the way people are doing it today. We were limited in terms of the jobs I could look for. And I needed a job because we needed the income. 
because here we were with two homes and our four kids who were all over the place and one of them young enough to be living with us in Washington. And I guess I used to hear criticism about some of the wives. And now it's not just wives, it's husbands to senators who are women. So it's totally different. But in that time, I was always, and some of the journalists would say, oh, be careful. Don't talk too much. Don't tell people too much and listen to this. They'd warn you and you can get yourself in trouble if you do that. Mm -hmm. So that I was always listening to being warned from the outside world and particularly the journalists. I'll never forget, you know, the first time we walked in to a reception of an old friend of Joe's who'd been in the city for a long time. And there were journalists there. And one of them, oh, so I, I remember it in a negative way now, but one of them said, oh, well, it's better for you. You know, why are you even here tonight? I said, I'm here with my husband at a reception for him. And you can't, don't, don't say too much. I looked at her and I said, I don't say too much, but when I speak, it's what I think and I'm honest. Mm -hmm. So then I walked away because I feel, Ugh. <laughs> but that's you, what you learn is you're supposed to keep then. But the truth is you can't keep your mouth shut. I learned lessons on the campaign and some of the speeches they wrote for me to deliver, I didn't want to say what they told me. So I wouldn't read everything they told me. And I wanted people to understand me honestly, not to think I was a puppy dog or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, but that's all the stuff that we've gone through as women. It just also found itself, manifested itself in the wife of a, a public servant. Mm -hmm. So you felt that they were trying to filter you, but you would not filter, you would not filter the truth is what you're, I think I hear you. Say. I felt part of it was that, and part of it was some people wanted you to emphasize X and not emphasize Y. For instance, when I dressed for the campaign, to 2000, I was told by 25 year olds at that point, I'm sure they weren't much older. You can't wear those shoes. They'll clash with tippers. Well, you can't, oh, that dress oh, wow. is the wrong color. Wow. And I just looked, I thought, oh, that's interesting. But you could, you know, you're on TV. You can't wear a, a, you know, a color that doesn't work. So some of that, you just had to, listen to and move forward and know that you're part of a TV set that's going out also, yeah. you know, yep. interesting. Yeah, okay. Um, you talk a lot in the book about um, work-life health balance, which I think everybody in this world is trying to figure out um, and layer on top of that a pandemic and they're, everybody's really trying to figure that out. Um, how have you been able to maintain that balance? What, have, what brings you to the place where you, you feel balanced? Well, and we all don't feel 100% balanced all the time. Ask my husband, <laughs> you know, when I'm whatever. <laughs> when I can't find the Zoom number tonight until I got it later. You know, it's that kind of balance. Um, but really, that's the hardest thing to balance the roles now it's being a mother being a father too today but of being able to produce what you need to at the top of your abilities and to interact with people in a way other than ipadding emailing you know we've we all have to go back into not being isolated because all of us have lost practice with it. But we're, I would say that I think that's the hardest thing to do, but we have to really breathe our way through. Exercise 
has been a saving grace. And Joe, I used to swim, but Joe got me into jogging and hiking more than I ever did. And we go out in the morning and, and do those things together. And it was during our tough Senate times or during the can, campaigns for a higher office, we'd sit, we'd walk and talk, run and talk. And that, that made a difference in our balance. We could say things to each other that you don't have time to do. We had a jogging stroller with our littlest and a psychiatrist who lives not far from us would say, oh my God, do you think that's gonna be good for this kid jumping up and down? So I thought, oh God, but he told me he was joking. Yeah. But you getting that balance is important and we all have to pull away for private quiet time. And we've been blessed because our Sabbath is Friday night and Saturday. And we don't do certain things. That was the joke with we had with Al Gore because we were waiting to find out about the election. And Al said to Joe, you know what? I'll mind the Saturdays and you know, you'll give me a break on the Sunday so I can go to church. <laughs> so we laughed. It was great. Because we need private time, quiet time, and also time to be able to speak to your spouse and to your children. Not easy. Good advice. Um, along that line, but maybe a little twist. Uh, you've been, you've had a wonderful career as well. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about your career related initiatives that you're most proud of, and both yours and Joe's in your career, as well as his career? and your combined efforts. What are, what are you folks most proud of um, in terms of helping to repair the world at this point? Well, yes, helping to repair the world, which is an important endeavor. Is that I just signed a book to a couple who's very close with my brother, who isn't from similar background, and he read the book. And I, he asked me to sign it, and I said, you know what? We need to stand together, work together to repair the world together. And that's the truth. We're all different, but we have to realize that being different means you can learn from other people. You can talk to other people. It's surprising. We live in a time now that people don't want to sit down at a table with someone who doesn't believe the same things they do, speak the same political dialogue, the same religious dialogue. That's wrong. We learn from each other all the time. And so I think that politics was a feature that I had never really been part of. And meeting Joe and living with Joe and campaigning with Joe showed me how people have to come together, respect each other, and talk to each other, and allow the people who are out there to articulate their needs, their struggles, to get people to understand local politicians. So I would say I've done a lot of things totally separate from politics, but if I were saying, to you what has been the most amazing and struck me because I naturally fit into it. And part of it is the way I was raised, who I am, what I am. I was able to be of help to Joe and to learn things from him. So I would say that was, you know, I worked on with women's health. Oh, and this is interesting. When it came to women's health, there were times I was in Brazil with women and they were worried about cancer. And another time, Saudi Arabia, talking to them about dental cancer. And what you realize, what I felt I realized 
is that women come together and it may even be to combat illness, but we really do a great job as when we're with someone. I remember at that point in time, it was a Saudi Arabian woman who was in the common group in Texas. And it was so amazing because she was saying how she doesn't drive a car and she doesn't do this shit. And we all march together in behalf of a common illness. Yeah. Okay. Um, you continue to do a lot of work. There's a thousand questions I could ask you, but um, okay. Because it, you, your book has uh, triggered a bunch of a lot of thoughts, but I'll narrow it down to a couple more. Um, and I appreciate you, you because you are from a similar background, right. which makes me feel you get we, it. We should, do, we should do lunch. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you continue to do a lot of work related to philanthropy uh, for Holocaust survivors. And I mm -hmm. want to give you a, a moment to tell us a little about why that work is so urgently needed at this moment. You mentioned it. I don't have the statistics in front of me. But the number of Holocaust survivors who are poor is amazing. Now, I, I'm on the board at UJA, New York, and they do a lot of work helping people all over the place and focusing on Holocaust survivors as one of their targets. Mm -hmm. And and also the coronavirus and helping people with that. We have so many targets all over the place, unfortunately, because mm -hmm. the world's not perfect yet. We're not waiting. Not, we're not, not exactly. We're um, working on it. <laughs> we're working on it. Um, turn, switching gears a little, switching gears. Uh, the 2000 election, I mean, you know, we, we have to talk about that because, you know, how could we not talk about it if we have right. the Libra right. in front of us, okay? So the rest, all the whole world was on spilkes, as we say technically in, in Yiddish. Uh, yes. What was going on and what was taking so long and how was it this back and forth? You were in the thick of it. What was that experience about for you? What, what did it feel like to be in the middle of all of that? It was unbelievable because from day to day, when we didn't know what was going on, it was, we'd get together with the Gores. Wherever we went, people in restaurants would start applauding or stop what they were doing and meet us, greet us. And to watch all these people assemble, and it was just all by accident going out, but it was, it was a shocking experience, but important because Joe and Vice President Al Gore were very close and they were very patient and quiet. There were no fight, there's no fighting that went on. One of the things that was amazing was we weren't sure the inauguration was on a Saturday and we weren't gonna drive down. So Joe and I thought, oh, we know there's this hotel we stayed at when Joe has votes and we'll walk over to the ceremonies on Saturday morning. So we go there Friday night, everyone there, is, it's a victorious group for Bush. So everyone's all of a sudden, I thought, oh, <laughs> This is really weird. So we immediately went home and ate at our friend's house last minute. The next morning, we walked over to the Capitol and went because Joe felt, you know, we need to go. Yeah. And it was an amazing moment. I want to read this to you. On Friday, December 9th, in the late afternoon, we got some good news. 
the Florida Supreme Court had ordered a manual recount of ballots in the three contested counties. Al wanted Joe and me to be with him and Tipper that evening. So, and it was Friday night, you know? So, Hani was with Joe's mother. And so the two of us were driven along with the Secret Service to the Naval Observatory, the official residence of the vice president, along with our movable Shabbat feast, because I put everything into a bag, the candles, the challah, the plastic plates, and, and we brought the ritual objects used to welcome the sab, candlesticks, candles, kiddush cup, wine, two challahs, and some food. Prior to dinner, Joe and I went into the living room to pray. When he was done, I noticed their lovely Christmas tree twinkling in the corner behind Joe when he was davening. Talk about being inclusive. <laughs> Tipper suggested that everyone put their blackberries away in deference to us. It would be easy enough for someone to find us if necessary. Dinner was an intimate affair. Our conversation ranged broadly. We discussed less on the election and more on the things for which we were grateful. At the end of the evening, the Gores walked us back to our house, trailed at a respectful distance by our Secret Service detail in their security vehicles. The next day, we went to the synagogue for morning services as usual, still hopeful given this most recent turn of events. But by that afternoon, when we learned that the United States Supreme Court had agreed to take the case, we were feeling much less optimistic. On the following Tuesday, the Supreme Court handed down its decision. Mm -hmm. So it was a complicated, difficult time. It took time to get over it, but you have to. And Joe decided he went to work. It was that Monday because he said, look, that's what I got to do. Of course, I, you know, at that point, I had taken time out from a hospital. I was working with on women's health in actually a Catholic hospital from New Haven, mm -hmm. St. Rayfield's. So this is how you, you hit these kinds of moments in life, right? Yep. Yes. Yep. It's, and it sounds like only grace is what I'm hearing from uh, in terms of what we saw. And it sounds like what you folks were actually doing behind the scenes as well. So, um, well, thanks thank for the you. insight. I have some audience questions. Uh, oh, good. All right. Um, are you surprised that we haven't had another president or vice president candidate that's Jewish since Joe? Do you think religion plays a role? Um, I can only say that it absolutely did not when Joe ran. Absolutely. People, and a lot of people who happen to be from diff mostly the Jewish religion because of the historic background that we testify to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's always a concern mm -hmm. because you worry, oh my goodness, how will they accept me? But it didn't happen. Now, could it happen today? I don't know. Do we know anything today? There's so much negative stuff that goes on with people, I don't know. In some ways we need to relearn how to get along with other people and maintain your own beliefs, but don't get paranoid if they're different from someone who's talking to you. We have to learn. That was something we learned how to be at the table. My father, I would be at the table and I had my opinion. I used to have to leave the table sometimes because his opinion was dominant, but that's, that's how we learned. Yes. Okay. Uh, have you had the opportunity to speak with or give advice to Kamala Harris and her husband or her husband, given uh, you know where we are in, in politics? No, I haven't. I haven't. You know, they're they're all very busy 
with many things. I have it. I don't know. I, I don't know that Joe has. I'm not sure. But we're not asking him now, so he can't answer. <laughs> I uh, haven't. Uh, I think we'll make, all right, th this question. As an observant Jew operating in the secular world of politics, how did you manage the conflicts? Uh, because I'm sure you mentioned a couple in terms of the Shabbat, but were there ever any that you just couldn't manage or how, how did you maneuver no. in that environment? Well, those first, right. First of all, we were always honest about who we are. And Joe, from the beginning, look, he said, I don't attend political events on Shabbat votes in the Senate. He went, he walked to the Senate and, and uh, the um, Capitol police who walked to and from, the ones who studied the Bible loved walking with Joe. They'd have the long walk and ask him all these questions or discuss it. And um, it really, it, there's no, we knew we didn't, we only ate kosher food. And we know, we knew we observed Shabbat. And one night, Richard Holbrook, it's a name that some people recall, was coming to dinner with several other people on a Friday night. I usually never did that. But of course, that Friday night, there were late, later votes and it was steaming hot. And so they're all coming in. And uh, I started made mozi and started to serve dinner because I didn't know when, if Joe was coming in. He walks in soaked from the weather. Everyone thought, oh, he's not gonna walk back. So he walked in and washed his hands, sat down and it was Shabbat. And Richard and our other guests marveled at the fact that he had walked home in the heat and he was there for Shabbat dinner. And we had, you know what? Instead of having any negative stuff, Shabbat, Joe had staff on Shabbat every Friday night meal where we were. And Joe had staff who said, oh, it's Shabuti. And they went out because they had a free <laughs> night. So it was never looked at that way. And I think, you know, Joe and I are proud of who we are. And it's never not afraid of people saying things, but there was nothing to say negative. We were teaching people that they also have to take time for themselves. Okay. I, that's, that's be yourself. I, and I, yes. I, I, that's a wonderful piece of advice for everybody. Um, last question is, how do you propose to keep the memory of the Holocaust alive given the many decades that have passed, the loss of so many survivors, and the lack of focus by the younger generation? Well, that's one reason I wrote the book because I felt it was my responsibility to do whatever I could do to follow through on my mother's instructions. I was lucky, my parents survived and the obligation, I understand everything you're saying is true, but we have a responsibility. There were so many people who died. I remember my father's words always as he saw people dying and just falling along. And he said, these people have no one to bury them. They have no one to say Kaddish. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. oh. That's what, anyway, I want to thank you for this wonderful, wonderful. Well, you, uh, like I said at the beginning, you are real, relatable, and down to earth. And I think this conversation has been all of that. So uh, I would, I, it was wonderful and I uh, really appreciate. And on behalf of Brandeis, we really appreciate. Thank uh, you. And thank you, Brandeis, for doing this. My thanks go to Brandeis from my heart. Back at you, as we say. <laughs> and I turn it over to Risa. Thanks so much, Lisa. Thank you. thank you so much for your expert questioning. Um, such mm -hmm. an incredible conversation. And Hadassah, thank you for sharing such emotional and personal stories. 
in such a relatable way. I mean, you really bring home so much of the experiences that we talk about in such an academic way. The immigrant experience, the daughter of a Holocaust survivor, you know, survivors, all of the stories of you know political experiences and what it's like to face the public in such a you know it, it, how challenging that is. So I thank you so much for making it so real for all of us. I hope this audience found tonight's event as interesting as I did. I I was you know it was gripping for me. Please check your email and social media, of course, for upcoming Brandeis Women's Network and Alumni Association events. I hope to see you all at an event soon. I want to make a special plug for Brandeis Women's Book Club. The next one is May 19th. We're reading Jean-Paul Lahiri's new book that was just reviewed in the New York Times. It's called Whereabouts, a novel. It was originally written in Italian and translated into English. Hadassah, please feel free to join us. We can send you a link. You're part oh, of the nice women now. Um, and I hope to see many of you in the next couple of weeks at more events. Thank you so much. Thank and I you. Think we're